Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, our, our webinar topic today is entitled uh, Integrating Livestock into a Cropping System for Sustainability and Soil Health. And uh, today we're going to examine how the Small Angus Ranch is working toward this topic. Uh, the Small started by uh, addressing the cropland and the rangeland and the hayland uh, resources. And then they went on to uh, supply a bridge, basically uh, cover crops and crop aftermath at this point, to uh, which the livestock can use to connect all these land uses together. And toward the end of the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the steps that are now on the table being discussed with the smalls as to where, where the, the path leads them next. And one of the reasons that we selected uh, Small Angus Ranch is because they're now four years uh, into their plan. And I thought that might be a really fun, exciting one to look at because in that four-year period they've done quite a bit. And in addition to that, um, we can pursue and take a look at some of the items that they're looking at moving forward with next. And I think you can kind of see the progression as we go. Now, it would have been a fairly straightforward topic, but um, David Lamb or someone decided to add the, the words sustainability and soil health into the topic. So when we do that, um, it's not just opening up a gate uh, onto the cropland and letting livestock in. Uh, when we want to move towards sustainability and soil health, it, it opens up a much wider parameter, and I think we need to address all these resource concerns and link them together to make this work uh, in the most effective manner that we can. And before we start, uh, I did want to thank uh, Small Angus Ranch, Mike and Becky Small, for allowing us to highlight uh, their ranch and, and use it in for discussion today. And it's really great of them. They've been wonderful to work with, um, two people that are on board with the resource. And they have a wonderful story to tell to, uh, to agriculture, to the general public. And, and I think uh, today, I, I hope that plays out uh, for you as well. So with that, um, we'll move into the topic and, um, and go from there. Uh, Burley County is located in uh, pretty much the center of North Dakota and uh, gives you a pretty good look at it in the map here, and you can see where, where we're located. If you look at our climate data, we're approximately uh, 16 inches of precip annually, and that includes uh, snow and rainfall both, so in a 12-month period, about a little over 16 inches. And uh, initially, when we started going down this soil health road, and this county did not have much for diversity, and we had lots of disturbance in our cropping system, soil disturbance, and we had no livestock integration, we didn't think we could really grow much with 16 inches of precip. And uh, once we started restoring soils, uh, we found out that that really wasn't the case at all. We had an adequate amount of moisture to grow most anything. So today we'll kind of highlight just one ranch that's moved down this uh, road with us. Now they, uh, they being Mike and Becky, have just recently finished um, a holistic management course. And so they've been updating their goal statement. But they got a pretty straightforward goal statement, and it's to be caretakers of the land and animals and enjoy farm life. And Mike and Becky Small and their four children, Andrew, Anna, Bethany, and William, so that, that's a pretty great goal statement, and in that period of time, we'll take a look at about a four-year period in here uh, from the time they started till, till present day. They also put together more, more recently some of the short-term and some more specific goals. And on cropland, it, it's basically on cropland, how do I increase diversity? And when we increase diversity, and we minimize soil disturbance and we get armor on the surface, good things happen with our soils and we start to rebuild them. So how do you increase diversity? That's one of their big goals on cropland. But um, grazing land uh, actually states that we are looking to bring uh, cropland and use it for grazing. So it's right in their goal statement. This integration that we're going to discuss today is defined in the family's goal statement, utilizing our cropland for grazing too. So right under the under the grazing land uh, option. So in addition, um, with the grazing lands, they're also looking at forming partnerships with neighbors 
And this is something the Smalls have been pretty effective uh, with, is uh, forming partnerships. And also uh, the cattle uh, portion, they're looking at bringing the herd up in size some. They started out with 220 head. Uh, they eventually want to start increasing this. And they're just in the process now of starting to move in this direction. They're, they're still, we're at 220 head this past year. But also looking at getting, uh, you know, getting, moving out some of the, calling out some of the older cattle and bringing in some of the younger stock. Then under animal diversity, they're presently looking at chickens, sheep, rabbits, horses. But there's sideboards with that. And the sideboards are, it has to be associated with family fun and involvement. So everything at the small ranch is a, is a team orientated and the entire family gets involved. And so they're looking at more animal diversity, but it has to come with family fun and involvement. And also the garden, uh, they're avid gardeners as well, and they uh, have taken uh, part in the Burley County Soil Conservation District's annual uh, garden, soil health garden tours that we've been having. And they uh, participate in those, and there's an interest in there. And so then it becomes, how do you bring soil health into the garden? And then lastly, on their short-term goals, they've uh, indicated uh, the tree plantings. They've done a number of tree plantings and adding a variety of trees to the farm and around the farmstead and protection for the livestock. So those, those kind of give you a pretty good idea of their overall goal and their short-term goal. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the grazing system and we're going to try to raise the soil health bar over this four year period on the grazing system. Then we'll look at the cropping system and try to do a similar item if we can raise the soil health goal there as well. And then we'll look at uh, integrating the livestock uh, between them. So what we started with on the grazing system, we'll look at a before uh, picture here. There's approximately 2,000 acres on the grazing system. And with that, they originally had six pastures and six herds. So what you're looking at then is you would have um, season-long grazing on those six pastures. And that was for a number of years. So they went in at the beginning of the grazing season, stayed in that one pasture until the end of the grazing season, and then were brought back to the, to the uh, farmstead for uh, winter. So this resulted in uh, a low vigor grass production. Uh, there was no drought management plan. Uh, there was no monitoring of the resource. The uh, calves were uh, feedlot weaned, so they were weaned off in the feedlot. Uh, when you were on site, you could see pretty extensive trailing, and these were all evidence of the season-long grazing. So we started a conservation plan in 2008, and then um, the range inventory was completed in 2009, uh, which indicated a downward trend which uh, would, not, would not be surprising, that's what we would expect, with an ecological site description of sands. So this gives us a little bit of a picture of the before on the rangeland. So then we're going to look at the grazing system on the after. Now we're, we're about four years later. So we still have the same acres, 2,000. Now they have a partnership formed with a local wildlife refuge, which is nearby in the neighborhood. And this uh, partnership allows the refuge to run some of their cattle to help manage and improve their grass stands. And of course, it helps the grazing system uh, with the smalls by supplying uh, additional recovery time. Uh, we are now moved down to three herds. These three herds are combined to two herds after the, after the breeding season is over. So we re reduce the herds pretty dramatically, combined. And we're now at 30 pastures, and so we've expanded the number of pastures uh, by additional cross fence, electric cross fence. It's uh, primarily a once over, but a number of the pastures are grazed twice. So it's combination. Uh, you'll have uh, a combination of a twice over and a once over uh, grazing system. And then uh, winter grazing has just been introduced now, and so we're just moving into the uh, first stages of winter grazing. We now have a drought plan. Uh, since we have now placed water on the hayland, uh, our drought management plan uh, would be to turn the hayland into grazing acres, into grassland, if, uh, if needed. And then uh, we are now weaning the calves on cover crops, 
And so that's something that we'll touch on as well. And then uh, they uh, did a one-time thing when they started their system. When they first year they started the, the grazing system in 2009, they actually went to the neighbor and rented rangeland from one of their neighbors and took their cattle off, off of their rangeland uh, and put it onto the rented rangeland from their neighbor in order to jumpstart the system and allow us to get some plant vigor back and allow us to harvest some sunlight and make those necessary changes. So that was a kind of a one-time thing where they actually did secure some rented acres from a neighbor. Now, if we look at the map, this is a map of the small operation. And <clears throat> as you can see on here, you can see the six major pastures. And then, of course, the, there's some cropland on the right side of your screen. And then on the lower right, you'll see there is some cropland and hayland involved, but primarily six major pastures. And you can see where we were using some uh, small dams and dugouts uh, and then some wells. And once we started to implement uh, the plan, it went to this. And you can see where we put in a pipeline. That's the black line. And we put in about seven uh, cell centers where we were able to bring in a number of pastures to one location. And with these additional pastures, of course, we're, and by combining the herds, we were able to increase the recovery time significantly. So let's okay. take a little closer look. Yes. Uh, this is Mark. I've had a couple of questions. Um, yes, one, are, are the smalls um, organic, or are they considering going that direction? And the then small, two, The smalls, uh, initially, um, they, are, they are not organic. Uh, on the before on the cropland, and when we get to that part, I, I'll explain that. But um, uh, the before is, is not organic, <clears throat> and the after, uh, they are now starting to move into, as they're building soils, starting to look at reducing fossil fuel inputs. And, and also, what was sort of the, the, the motivator behind the, the changes? You said they came in in 2008 um, with starting a conservation plan. What was kind of the driver? Well, I think I think one of the drivers was when um, Mike attended one of the um, uh, Burley Soil District Soil Health Tours, and we had a chance to go on to a number of operations that evening and visit with the people that had uh, gone down a similar road. And I think that's kind of what uh, one of the principal items that started moving Mike and Becky forward. Oh, thank you. Activities. Yep. Okay. Okay, so if we move forward, uh, what I'd like to show is um, this photo point uh, we took for uh, four years in a row. This was our first year, and we were just starting to install some of the fences. And this was 2009, and in this particular year was the year that the Smalls rented rangeland from their neighbors and actually took the cattle off of their uh, rangeland that year. And they brought them back much later in the year, late fall, and they did do some fall grazing on this uh, much later in the year. But for most of the summer, they were removed. And so Mike started building fences. So if we look at this one, and you see the railroad tie on the left side of your screen. So when we go to the next screen, 2010, you can see where it's, um, we now started to get a little bit of uh, plant height out there, a little biomass production. And Mike was installing livestock pipelines and cross fences in 2010. So you can see we got a little bit of a start on some biomass production in 10. Then if we move to 2011, that was our third year, and we started to get a lot more production. And uh, just pounds of biomass we could physically see was starting to, uh, to improve. And you can also see that if you live in Burley County and North Dakota, that even in the middle of June, you might still be wearing a big jacket because we do get a few cool days then, too. So then if we look at the fourth year on this same site, fourth year we started monitoring. This is one of Mike's um, uh, daughters, and the this is Anna. And, and now you can see we started monitoring, and it's a, kind of a simple type monitoring where we are looking at the height of the material before and after. So before the cattle come in and then after they go out. So they're starting to monitor and starting to <clears throat> get a, a bit of a handle on the, the biomass production. So you can start to see the same location here four years in a row where things are starting to turn around. And then okay, has that field been grazed? 
this uh, this one that on uh, the fourth year that we're just looking at right now that I just went back to, like it shows on there, hadn't been grazed yet. It's like the little sign says they're not grazed yet. Since since what year? Well, it, it's been grazed every year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 2009 the cattle were taken off, but they came back in late in the year, and then 2010 and 2011 the, the rotational grazing system was in place. And then <clears throat> this is 2012 now on the screen, and so every every year this pasture has been grazed every year. But now we're starting to get long periods of recovery time. So we've come we've we've switched from the uh, season long grazing, and now we're into the very short exposure periods, and we're into very long recovery periods. So you can visually just visually see, and we're also going to look at some clipping data but you can start to visually see there's quite a change in the landscape. So. And so the monitoring has kind of become a group effort, and the, the small when the smalls get involved, uh, they like to bring in their entire family, and I think uh, it's a good way to look at, at monitoring in each pasture. Then in addition, uh, as Mike was installing the... Um, the physical practices like the pipelines and the tanks, uh, this is one that's in progress, but he set up about seven of these and uh, allowed a number of pastures to come in uh, with the pipeline, fresh water, rubber tire tanks uh, with cement cores poured in them. Uh, this one is uh, partially constructed, but it gives you a pretty good feel for what one of the centers would look like. So you can see that Mike did put a, a bit of work into this. And ended up installing a little over three miles of livestock pipeline, and then a little over ten miles of uh, of cross fence. And the cross fence is uh, primarily uh, electric, so it gives you a pretty good idea of the extent of the practice uh, supporting practices. And then the uh, the uh, drought management plan uh, basically was put into place in the fall of 2012, uh, just this past fall. We now have water placed on the hayland, and we also have water placed on the cropland. So the photo on the left, um, you can see the hayland, some alfalfa, an alfalfa field in the background. And the photo on the right, you can see one of Mike's cornfields in the background. So we're starting to get set up for some of the physical practices that will allow this integration to occur. Now, we visited just a little bit uh, when Mark had the question about where these pastures grazed. Yes, they were grazed every year, but if we look at the recovery time now, Mike's average recovery time, if he comes back into a pasture a second time, it will only be after a 75 to 90 day period, at least 90, sometimes more, of recovery. And this is one of the real strengths of Mike's system is that he can get a a long recovery period in there before the herd comes back for a second grazing. And with a 90-day recovery period, a uh, significant amount of time to reestablish that root system and carbohydrate storage and allow a lot of sunlight harvest to occur. And then, of course, the amount of time that they're in the pasture now is always less than, every, every, uh, every pasture is going to be less than two weeks. So, <clears throat> some are maybe five or six days, some as much as maybe 10, 11, 12 days, depending on the size of the pasture, of course. So it kind of gives you a feel for where this is at. But long recovery periods, very short exposure periods. Now, in addition, uh, like, like your classical grazing system, Mike's been changing the season of use as well. And when he changes the season to use, that allows the warm seasons or cool seasons to evolve. And I think that's been a very positive thing. The other thing that it does is if you are looking at uh, later in the summer, it allows a lot of high carbon material to be placed on the soil surface. If you are early in the season, it allows a lot of low carbon material to be placed on the soil surface. And so... I think when you're looking at this thing from the season of use change, you're also benefiting the soil biology. When you are bringing in a very low carbon, a lush green plant early in the year and it gets onto the soil surface, that really benefits the bacterial end significantly. When you bring the rank mature material in the fall onto the soil surface, 
that really benefits the fungal community. And so not only are you benefiting the cool season and warm season species, but you're also benefiting the soil biology. And I think there's, there's a lot of connect there. And we'll look at another slide a little further in to explain that a little better. Now this next slide, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some clipping data, but to set the stage on the clipping data, I just wanted to explain that the first clipping was done in 2009. And so on the left side of your screen, you can take a look in 2009 from April through October, we had 19 inches of precip, just a little over. If you look on the right side of your screen at the 2012 data, you will see that we had just about 11 inches. So significantly less rainfall received in 2012. Like a lot of the nation uh, that was under a drought scenario, we were drier too. And then if you look at the uh, average maximum temperatures, uh, for instance, if you look at July in 2009 was 77, July in 2012 was 87.8. So not only was it uh, drier in 2012, but it was hotter. So hot and dry was kind of the, the tone for 2012. Now let's look at the clipping data. Uh, we'll look at the initial clipping data in 2009 before the before the grazing system started, and then we'll look at it in 12 after about four years at it. So the, <clears throat> the clipping data in 2009 just for biomass production uh, was in <clears throat> pasture number three, and uh, the uh, site was uh, GPS coordinates, and it's a 62-acre pasture, and we already uh, established that 2009 was a wetter than an average year, and it was clipped in the fall of 2009, and if you remember, 2009 was the year that Mike and Becky rented the neighbor's rangeland and took the cattle off of their operation. So this site was not clipped. This site was not grazed until sometime after the clipping. And the average dry weight was 2119, so 2,119 pounds, and no livestock grazed on it in 2009 until late in the fall. Well, let's look at the 2012 data went back to pasture number three and found those same coordinates. And now we know it was a drier than an average year in 2012, not only drier, but hotter. And we clipped it in the fall of 2012. The average dry weight was 1770 pounds, but now the difference is it had been grazed twice uh, that summer. And so how much? If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the 14,000 pounds. That's an average weight of one of Mike and Becky's cows times 2.6% of their body weight times the 2010 grazing days that occurred on field three. And if we divide that by the 62 acres, we get 1,180 pounds of forage harvested. I didn't compute any pounds for the calves that are at side. I just computed these pounds for the cows, so it's a, it's a little more conservative figure that way. But now you can see where our total production came in at 2,950 pounds. So have we produced more pounds of biomass after four years on this system on a hotter and drier year than what we started? Yes, significantly additional pounds. And so this is one of the items that Mike and Becky are working toward and one item that is going to benefit them tremendously when they start moving from 220 pairs to maybe 230 or 240 pairs. So we're setting the stage for that to occur. So what does this rangeland uh, look like today? <clears throat> I think uh, this gives us a four-year look at, at the rangeland, and we can see now at the end of four years where we're starting to get in position here. We're starting to get a pretty strong root system. We have more biomass production now at the end of four years. And so you can see where we've uh, raised the bar, leaning toward a bit of sustainability and a little and a bit of soil health. We're moving in those directions. And so that, that kind of gives you a feel for the, the rangeland resource at this point. And so what I'd like to move into next is the cropland resource and show you a bit of before and after on it as well. Okay, so on the cropland, the cropland consists of 800 acres. It's a conventional system, okay? It's not organic, it's a conventional system. Consisted of no-till corn, and then all other crops were tilled. So 
So there would be one year no-till and then a couple of years of full tillage and then back to this one year of no-till. And then uh, primarily two crop types, um, warm and cool season grasses. So in other words, corn would have been the warm season grass and oat would have been the cool season grass. And the corn was uh, chopped and the small and chopped and removed for silage, and the small grain residue was baled and removed as well. And so you would end up with bare soils and evidence of erosion. So if you take a look at uh, the photo on the right, that was a pretty good example of a starting point in 2009. Uh, crop was was chopped and removed, uh, bare soils, and you can see where some water uh, with overland flow had come down the drainage area. So when we would run the soil conditioning index, which is part of the um, revised universal soil loss equation, we actually showed a negative one on there, which would be an indicator of a cropping system that would be in declining mode for soil organic matter, so a declining soil organic matter. And then also we were removing the bales from the hayland. And then uh, we took all of the soil organic matter uh, tests, all the soil tests that we could find at the start, and they averaged uh, for the farm 1.7%. So it gave us a feel for soil organic matter levels where they were at, and then of course the conservation plan started in 2008 just like it did on the rangeland. So that was our before cropping system. And this was a 2009 photo of, uh, of the crop coming up in nine, and you could you can tell by looking at um, the bare soils, uh, you see in this photo we really didn't have any armor on there. And you can also see the horizontal compaction layers in the soil, and you can see the horizontal uh, rooting of the oat crop. And it was primarily a fine sandy loam. And it's the soil biology, again, that builds this back. And so what we need to do is put the pore space back into these soils by building soil aggregates. And as we build soil aggregates with the soil biology, we're going to also hook them together with the glomalin that's produced by a combination of the plant and the, and the fungi. And so as these make the, the glue or the glomalin to hold these soil aggregates together, we can start to bring this soil back in health. And just like when we build a road and we use a lot of compaction or we use a, a disc or a sheep's foot press, uh, Essentially, what the road builder wants to do is take the pore space out and compress the soils so no water goes into the roadbed. And over time, it's what happens in our cropland soils with tillage as well. We end up subtly, one year at a time, taking out the pore spaces. And so this gives you a pretty good example of what uh, Mike and Becky started with on their cropland. Now, after four years, as you, this is the spring of uh, 2012, you can see we now have residue on the soil surface. And so this is a, this is a start. And uh, we're getting armor, we're getting the soil protected. So now all the crops are seeded no-till, and we have cover crop combinations that are being used to wean the calves. And so this is a different uh, weaning method and a different way to start the calves. And then we primarily have three crop types now, so we've increased the, um, the crop diversity on the cropland, and we've added some cool season broad leaves to the existing warm season grass and cool season grass. The corn silage acres have been reduced, so we're exporting less carbon off the field and leaving that on the soil surface. The residue on the soil surface is, is now in place, and wind and water erosion is now when, when you'd walk those fields, you'd pretty much say non-existent. And then livestock integration is now starting, uh, started the fall of 2012. And when you would run the soil conditioning index at this point now, it would start to be a positive number, which would indicate to you that the soil organic matter levels are in a, a slow upward trend. And we do have soil organic uh, matter present now, uh, when we average it for the farm, is coming out to 1.9. So we feel that we are starting a, a slight upward trend on soil organic matter levels with cropland. So again, moving toward this soil health, moving toward sustainability. And here's a pretty good shot of what the cropland soils look like now. 
And so we do have pretty good cover when we look straight down. Uh, we don't really want to see the soil surface. We want to see some residue. So uh, we feel pretty good about that. Healthy soils, healthy crops. Uh, we had a dry year, but the smalls had a good, good production year in 2012. Now, another uh, exciting moment uh, occurred on August 17th, and uh, everybody was uh, all smiles and pretty happy about this. And uh, for some people, this might not be a big item, but for us, it, it was. But we had our first earthworm, and it's the first earthworm on sandy soils on the small farm. And uh, the earthworm picked a cover crop combination to um, make its home. And normally, they don't like the coarse sands because it's very, very uh, abrasive for them to get around in. But if it starts to get buffered uh, with some soil organic matter levels increasing, that would help it. And so it's uh, our first indicator of uh, moving toward soil health on these cropland soils. So now we've looked at the uh, grazing system and we've looked at the cropping system. And we moved toward those items that were in the topic entitled sustainability and soil health and put us into a situation where we can bring those levels up and now start to look at bringing in the livestock end. So, Jay? That's, yes. If you don't mind, I had a question come in about your increase in organic matter in your experience that, um, that was about 0.2% increase. Is that fairly typical from what you've seen in people who have who have started when, to build soil health, or is that is that pretty fast, or is it typical? When we moved into the um, uh, cropping systems with higher higher diversity and armor on the systems, et cetera, livestock integration in the 90s, on a lot of them increased by 1% in 10 to 12 years. Now, if you bring in, you can accelerate uh, this, we found, if you bring in cover crop combinations, you integrate livestock, you can start to increase this faster. But initially, it took us a good 10, 10 to 12 years on a typical farm in Burley County to increase 1%. So after four years, uh, 0.2, I think they're pretty much on track. I think it's pretty close. Um, it was the fourth year in that we first got the residue established on the soil surface. So I think a lot of the uh, a lot of this increase just occurred in the last year or two, but uh, I would say it's pretty close. It's pretty close to what we've seen before. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So then, how do we bring cattle onto this cropland? And uh, that was the challenge. And so we kind of broke it into two areas. Um, Mike and Becky decided to start weaning their calves on a cover crop combination, and they thought. This would work in well with their healthier livestock goal and their soil health goal. And also at this time, they were starting to look at wildlife. So we took a look at a uh, cover crop combination. And if you see uh, pearl millet, prozo millet, sedan, those first three species, they all can be fairly mid to high carbon type plants. And keep in mind now, we were looking for some residue on the surface. And so this would give us a higher carbon material. And then we brought in the soybean and the cow pea to feed the rest of these plants. And they were going to supply, be the nitrogen source for the rest of these plants. And then we brought in the radish and the turnip to be able to scavenge any nitrogen or any nitrate that would be available. And uh, we didn't want any of this leaching into these sands, and we didn't want any escaping and so we brought in the scavengers. And so this was one of our first uh, mixtures that we came forward with uh, regarding weaning the calves. And that was seeded in, in mid-June. Now the calves were weaned on uh, October 16th, and they were placed in the feedlot on the 16th, and then the cow herd uh, returned to the grazing system. Okay, And the calves were brought into the cover crops then on October 24th. And it was interesting uh, to watch them uh, because it took them a little acclimation time without their mother. But they averaged a little over 400 pounds, and there were 210 calves, and we brought them on to 33.7 acres. And uh, then it was a matter of, uh, of observing. 
And some of the interesting observation is um, Mike had swathed one round with the wind rower on the outside of the field, and the calves just kind of walked around where the wind rower went and then eventually slowly started going into the cover crop. And But it took them a little acclimation the first day, but some observations that Mike had as he was watching the calves is how quickly any runny nose is cleaned up. And he was very pleased with the health of the calves, and and this was the first year <clears throat> first year that they were integrated this way, but he's he's run it every year since, and um, I think that's a pretty good indication that it was working. And when you would observe them, they were balancing their diet, and they would take a little bite of uh, radish or turnip, just enough to meet their protein needs, and then they would work maybe on a millet seed head or maybe on the leaves of the um, soybean and and. Uh, a herbivore is very good at selection when we allow it diversity in front of it. And so if we, if we, have, if we allow them to have diversity, uh, they're very good at selecting for themselves. I had one of my longtime ranchers here in Burley County tell me one time that the cattle are much better at taking care of themselves than we are at taking care of them. But we just have to get to that point where we realize that. So the calves did very well in balancing their diet. They were removed on uh, November 22nd, and so they were on there for 30 days, and that uh, computed out to uh, 6,300 grazing days, or a total of 187 uh, grazing days per acre. And you can put your own value of what you feel one grazing day is worth, but uh, they were on there for 30 days. And then keep in mind, we're looking for armor on the soil surface. So if we take a look, this is the shot on the day that they, they left the field. Uh, you, you looked straight down and, and you didn't see any soil. And so that was one of our goals was to get, to get a uh, good armor cover on the soil surface. So we felt pleased with that. Well then of course, uh, this, this gave us uh, an integration with the calves. And now of course we wanted to go back to Mike thinking about this and say, okay, how do we bring the cows on? Well, if you recall, in one of the earlier slides, uh, I showed where we had some water now set up on the cropland. And so with the cropland, we now were able to graze some of these crop residues that were quite a ways removed from the farmstead and from any water location. And essentially in the first year, in, uh, two, which was 2012, they gained 40 additional grazing days in November and December. So, and, and, and these grazing days, uh, keep in mind, could they take more material? Yes, but we want to leave at least half or more of the material on the soil surface. Soil biology benefits from this, and as does any erosion benefits, etc. So just those 220 pair, we picked up an additional 40 days just with the crop residue portion. Now, obviously, we can go above and beyond this, and that's where the smalls are moving next. And so these are some of the options that are on the table with them now that they are looking at for their 2013 season. And uh, Mike and Becky are looking at planting some standing forage grazing this year in their cropping system. So the next step here is most likely going to be in the upper right-hand corner of your screen is going to be the standing forage grazing. And then in addition, they're looking at stockpiling some additional forage on the rangeland. And so those two top options are the ones that are most likely going to be occurring next, especially the standing forage grazing as Mike is making plans for putting a forage out there that they can come in and graze during the winter time, specifically for for grazing, and of course it'll have the wildlife benefits and the diversity benefits all at the same time. Now, to kind of understand this a little bit better, um, Becky made a comment the other day that really caught my attention, and she said, "You know, in the last four years, I kind of look at our ranch as we're building this puzzle, and we've built the border now." We put the border of the puzzle, and now we're going to fill in all the pieces inside the border. And I thought that's a really good analogy of all the work that they've done so far with the fencing and the 
uh, water tanks uh, with the cell the cell centers and the diversity in the cropping and and the cover crops and integrating the calves. Now they're filling in the center of the puzzle. And I think these are going to be some of the pieces that are going to be filled in next. Standing forage, certainly. Now the bottom two are items that are on the table and have been discussed with them. And these are ones that are going to be considered, but I think we're going to start with the top part of the screen, work our way toward the bottom. A lot of our winter grazing people use bale grazing for a worst case scenario when the weather gets extremely bad and cloth grazing when the weather is not quite as bad and then of course the standing forage is when it's much much better out as far as snow depth etc gives you those options so it kind of gives you some idea of where we're going with that Jay, um, I had yeah. a, qu a question if you could um, go into the standing forage grazing just a little more most likely what the standing forage grazing is going to be and what Mike and I have uh, talked about and had some discussion here in the office and then out at the ranch site with Becky too, is that um, a cover crop combination is going to be put in. And Mike said he thought he would start with maybe around 25, 30 acres of a standing cover crop. And uh, so the standing forage grazing it will not be windrowed. It won't be baled. It won't be chopped. It won't be taken to the yard. It'll stay standing right in the cropland, and the cattle will, will graze it right in place. And uh, because it'll have a lot of diversity in it, uh, you know, and we'll take a look at some fecal analysis coming up here, we feel that's going to do very well. So that, that's how that's looked, uh, how we're looking at setting that portion of it up. Yep. And so he would plant that after a, an early crop comes off or on a... That a, one is actually going to be planted in, most likely in mid-June. So it'll be the only, it'll be the only thing that grows on the, those acres that year, that summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a full season cover crop combination, and it'll be, rather than bailing it up, it'll be left standing in place. Okay. Yep. Now, as we move deeper into winter, we got considerations to make. Now, so far, Mike and Becky have taken crop residues in November and December. That's not as difficult for us. But now as we move here in North Dakota, as we move deeper into winter, we need some considerations of the nutrient need of that cow. And uh, Dr. Lardner at the uh, University of Saskatchewan was good enough to share this uh, graph with me that illustrates it quite well. There's a 100-day critical period that many of you are very aware of where the energy need for that cow, lactate for a cow that's uh, in gestation, uh, it starts to increase. And it occurs 30 days before to 70 days after calving. There's approximately a 100-day peak in the, in the demand. And so what's, what becomes critical here as we move further into winter, the calving date becomes very critical. Right now, uh, Mike is calving in March and April. And so consequently, 30 days before that, uh, when you are 30 days before, you would be, say, for instance, the beginning of February. Uh, that's not a time when you want to be stressing or roughing the cow as much. If you can get further back from calving, say, 60 days, now you're in a much better position to be uh, winter grazing, and your cost of production can be looked at pretty, with a pretty critical eye. So it's as we get closer, a lot of people in our county now have moved into May, for instance, for calving on grass. Well, you're in a perfect position for winter grazing when you're calving in May. So calving in, in, Feb, in, calving in March, uh, like uh, Mike and Becky are right now, that's workable. But uh, we probably, and they're presently in November and December for grazing, we can definitely go into January and maybe go... Uh, a bit further into that, but we want to be aware of the energy need of that cow as we get within 30 days of calving. But we definitely can move into January yet. So it's just another item that we kind of keep in mind and to help monitor something that we're going to be starting next on Small Angus Ranch is fecal analysis uh, going through the nutritional balancer. And so what we'll do is we will periodically send in a fecal analysis on these cows and monitor them during the winter grazing. 
And this is an illustration of some at the Minokan Farm. The Minokan Farm is uh, owned and operated by the Burley Soil District. And you can see that the crude protein came back at 7.2 and the energy came back at 58.6. And so we can take a look at that and say, is this where we want to be? Because if we go a bit further and take a look at the next one at the Minokan Farm, we were grazing a cool season cover crop combination and it had a much higher crude protein. This one included um, hairy vetch and a number of other species, cool season species, and of course our energy is higher. So the fecal analysis for our winter grazing will allow us to know where we're at. You know, are we meeting the nutrient need of that cow? Are we over meeting it or are we just meeting it? Where are we at? And then in addition to that, uh, we can go ahead and select from the standing forage or the crop aftermath uh, maybe he's going to look at some supplemental feeding with this, uh, but this will allow a management tool to allow us to take a look at it. Now, if we also uh, look at um, another one of our cooperators, um, Gabe Brown, we who also looks at bringing livestock onto cropland, and we ask ourselves, what what are the benefits of integrating these livestock onto cropland? And this is probably one slide that I can share with you that did it have an impact? I, I feel it really did. On the left side of the screen, there was two years of mob grazing on cropland uh, during the summer, and they were grazing cover crop combinations. And you can see on the, fr on the uh, first line, the total biology was over 6,000 nanograms per gram. Now on the other side of the shelter belt, there was also a long-term fields with lots of diversity, but no livestock. And so the field on the right had high crop diversity and had cover crops, but it didn't have the livestock portion in it. And so consequently, you start looking at the impact. Well, the soil biology definitely, the level of soil biology definitely increased. And so it's, it's interesting to observe from a soil biology viewpoint uh, what impacts happen when we bring cattle onto cover crop combinations. The two together definitely have an impact because you're looking at increasing with the diversity and with the livestock, you're increasing the food, and it's quite a difference. Um, we've followed this up in past years when it goes back to a monoculture, maybe back to a corn crop or a wheat crop, and you run the soil biology then and you will see it come down. And so it's a lot like us people. When there's lots of food, we do quite well. Uh, when there isn't, we don't do as well. And so consequently, uh, it's a pretty good uh, analogy or one of the better ones that I can use to show you of impacts of livestock on cropland. So one of the reasons were very important to me of smalls bringing livestock onto cropland, the second reason is we're in a decline uh, as far as uh, U.S. beef cow inventory. Somewhere is around 73 or 4 we peaked and we've been declining on beef cow inventory since. And so we need to be looking at cropping systems like the smalls have for a place to bring the beef industry onto. If we, if we look at some of the world production now and for some of our uh, protein, some of our meat protein, the far left side is ocean catch, and you can see the ocean catch uh, has planed out in millions of tons and maybe slightly coming down. So ocean catch has not been increasing. If you look at pork, which is the second line from the left, uh, the blue one, you'll notice that it's got a very sharp upward trend. Okay, So pork production, pretty strong upward trend. If you look at poultry, uh, the red one, also going up, not as high as not as high a production as the pork, but significant. And then if you look at um, uh, the farmed fish, uh, the far right one, uh, fish in a tank, as I like to call it, farmed fish has been increasing dramatically. In fact, if you look at the beef line, now this is world production again. If you look at the beef line, it appears as though farmed fish now has started to overtake beef production. And so. What is it that we can do with the beef industry 
going back now from world production and just talking within the United States, where are we going to go with the beef production in the future? Now, we know that uh, farmed fish has a very high conversion uh, per pound of additional grain. Two pounds of grain for a pound of additional gain on a fish. Poultry is a little over two pounds of grain. Pork is a little over three. Beef is over six. So beef, is, beef being a herbivore, how do we put it in a position to do what it does best? And what it does best is graze. And so it's, it's critically important that we start to integrate these livestock onto the cropland. If we don't, I think our beef industry uh, is, is going to be coming to some critical junctures. Uh, if we take a look at just those, some local information here in Burley County, these are the number of acres of native rangeland that have been converted to cropland in each of the last five years. Well, you can see where in 2012 we had 5,000 acres converted to cropland. Well, 5,000 acres, that's like two or three small Angus ranches. And so you can see how significant that is. And each time that we take native rangeland out and convert it to cropland, we make it more difficult for the beef industry. And so the beef industry, I feel we have a lot of potential in our cropping systems where the beef industry can play a role. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's vitally important that we be taking a look at some of the operations like Small Angus Ranch. Now at this time, I kind of wanted to visit just a little bit in terms of um, some of the future considerations. And Mark, are we OK on time yet? Um, if I can get, yeah. get a couple of minutes yet, uh, we'll, we'll go into the um, closing. Uh, some of the future things that the smalls are looking at is wildlife. And that's something they're looking at uh, changing their grazing system and starting to bring uh, the wildlife and the nesting and that type of those type of considerations into the planning for their grazing system in 2013. Calving date, uh, moving it into uh, a grass calving date, like for instance May, is something that's been discussed with them. Uh, insect enhancement. Uh, especially something we want to do this fall is want to start or this summer rather start taking a look at the uh, dung beetles. You know every dung beetle is capable of holding up to 30 mites on it, and when the dung beetle lands on the cow path, it's critically important that uh, the that the mites be able to get off and actually attack the the fly eggs, and so that's going to be a, a very critical item as well. I guess uh, the soil biology test, we touched on those a little bit. And the nutritional balancer, we touched on those a little bit. And then the hayland, uh, we're also discussing no exporting of carbon on the hayland is another item that we are talking about. So Mark, I've got, um, I've got a minute or two yet. Um, we will just close out with the human aspect on the partnerships. And on the partnerships, the Smalls have done a really good job. Uh, the Missouri NRCS group, that's been, been a tremendous uh, group that came last summer to visit Small Angus Ranch and others in Burley County. Uh, the Texas NRCS group uh, came up and visited the Small Ranch and a number of others in the county. Um, the French farmers uh, in Quebec through the Ministry of Agriculture and, of course, we've used the Small Angus Ranch as a conservation planning course over the last couple of years as well. So I just kind of wanted to end on the human aspect and uh, give a very special thank you to Small Angus Ranch and would be happy to try to answer any questions. Okay. Jay, I had uh, one come in asking about um, whether, you treat, whether they treat for flies on their cows since they're moving them so often. Um, one thing that, uh, uh, visiting with Mike on that, uh, there is some porons that were put on in the fall for lice. And uh, most of the fly control in the summer, if we're able to move, we can usually leave the fly issue behind us. And uh, especially if we're able to go, uh, say, over a half mile, you can normally leave the fly issue behind. So we're trying to handle most of the fly issue uh, through the moves in the grazing system. So. And also, somebody was asking about the relationship 
between you're talking about dung beetles and, and mites. Yes. And well, we can expound on that a little bit. Uh, the dung beetle itself, you know, uh, is interested in the cowpat, so it's interested in the manure. But it's actually the mites that are on the dung beetle that are going to attack the the fly eggs and the maggots. And so it's uh, and as these um, a number of mites will be on each dung beetle, and it's been recorded that up to 30 mites can be on one dung beetle, and so with the mites the dung beetle is way more effective than if he doesn't have the mites on him. It's just another connect in nature that we need to be aware of, so that we can take you know we can we can nurture that relationship. Yep. And then I had a, a question regarding. Um how they determine when to start and end the grazing um, about using, do they use vegetative characteristics to okay. determine when to that's start a, and end the grazing, and if they do, what are those characteristics? That, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, in our range inventory, one of the items that came out, which, which we knew, but um, one of the sites was actually as high as 40% Kentucky bluegrass. And what we've been doing with the Kentucky bluegrass, uh, we've actually been coming out there in, um, in April and going through some of these pastures maybe two or three days, very lightly, but topping the Kentucky bluegrass. And so we're, our goal there, we know we're not, we're not trying to eliminate it, but we're trying to bring it back into balance, suppress it a, br a bit where we can bring the warm seasons on a little bit stronger. And so these pastures where we've been coming into early, uh, later in the summer you can visually see which ones we came in topped for the Kentucky bluegrass. Because when you come in there that early, none of the natives are there. It's you know we're just looking at the Kentucky blue at that point, and then we're coming in much more in line with the normal startup after that, uh, as we get down toward the end of May, uh, more of a normal startup into the grazing system. But we will come in, especially in April, and try to top some of the Kentucky bluegrass. Yes. Good question. Uh, Jay, this is David. There's a question that came in about, uh, let me just read it, from the South, and they're concerned about the Southeast with exceptional amount of wet conditions and lack of cold, cold enough temperatures to freeze the soil. What their concern is, what's the impact that that might have yeah. uh, on the soil there? You got a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, we, we brought livestock onto uh, cropland during the summer, uh, mob grazing, cover crop combinations. But if we have, uh, give an example, if uh, when we do this, and, and uh, obviously during the summer and there's there's no frozen soils, uh, if we have very wet conditions, you know, we're pretty picky about that. We don't bring the livestock on, on in wet conditions. And so we will pick and choose our time uh, when we have, um, you know, when it's that wet. Uh, of course, our winters, uh, we're looking at a much, uh, you know, we freeze solid seven feet. So we know we have a pretty good situation for winter grazing. But the other observation that we've had is when we come in on the spring or the fall and we come in on a live plant, a lot more load-bearing capacity. You know, a live plant uh, will carry a cow or a tractor or anything uh, much better on the soil surface than when there's not a live plant. So if we have compaction issues, uh, we definitely want it to be coming in on a live plant. It makes a huge difference on soil compaction. Yep. And just just to follow up on that too, Jay, I know that the stockpiling of forages look real nice here in in Western North Carolina, which kind of reinforces what you're saying. You have a a living biomass that supports, uh, and the key there is not to overgraze it. Make sure you leave something there. Correct. So. And and uh, the smalls have been very good about that. Um, any of the uh, crop aftermath or any of the cover crops. Uh, and on the rangeland itself, um, you know, at this point in time, we've been pretty careful. We're staying in that uh, first half. You know, we rarely get up to 50%. But um, in that four-year period, that 50% we're removing has definitely gotten larger. Jay, I had somebody asking what lab tests is used for soil organic matter? The, test, uh, the tests that we've been using for soil organic matter and for the bio, the biology test too. Uh, we've been using uh, Ward Labs in Kearney, Nebraska, so it's wardlabs.com, and we've been sending our soil tests down there, and then we get both the conventional soil test, 
where you would have NPK, soil organic matter, uh, cation exchange, all of that normal and usual, plus we get the biological test. So we, we send them to uh, wardlabs.com, and uh, we get both done at the same time, and it gives you a little more of a look at what you have. Yep. And Jack, better request, if you could bring up your seeding mix again on that cover crop mix. On, on the uh, the one that was used for the calves. Yes. Okay. The one that was used. Yeah. The one that was uh, used on the calves is we used. Um, I've got it right here. We had two pounds of pearl, and two pounds of prozo, four pounds of sedan, fifteen pounds of soybean, ten pounds of cowpea, two pounds of radish, and one pound of turnip. Now that that's not a magical recipe for anyone. That's that's what fit for small Angus Ranch. And, and did, uh, did they have any concerns about um, nitrates or prussic acid, or did they? Yeah, they, that's a good question. Uh, nitric, uh, prussic acid, and any nitrates. Um, when uh, here here in the county, when we used to graze monocultures uh, in the fall, uh, we would usually lose a critter or two. Uh, because maybe it had high prussic acid or maybe it had high nitrates. Now that we've gone to the combinations, they're much safer because you have a combination of plants and you allow the herbivore to select. And uh, since we've gone to combinations, our death losses are dropped tremendously. And uh, it's been a much safer environment to graze. Now, no, that's a good question. Combinations, definitely safer. Yeah, let me let me ask the last question here. What what effect has this had on their overall nutrient management and, and pest management strategies for both the cropland and, and the and the rangeland? Well, you know what we're looking at. Uh, one of the next steps we're looking at on the cropland is looking at reducing commercial uh, fertilizer, and uh, this was one of the early on goals. And but you have to restore some soil health to get to the point that you can start this start some reduction. And as we increase soil organic matter levels and as we get more efficient, you know, we want to start to reduce some commercial fertility. And and I think uh, the other items that we're looking at is uh, any insecticides or fungicides uh, are things that Mike and Becky are, are not wanting to use. And so what can we do then in this cropping system to continue to reduce fossil fuel inputs? And I think that's really critical when we start looking at the whole connect with the holism uh, between the insects and between the livestock and the soil biology and the crop diversity and the grazing system. How do we how do we start moving toward this? And as we restore these soils and the functionality of them, we put ourselves in a position to start doing some of the fossil fuel reduction. And uh, this is this is next you know in their next line of. Um, of moves of where they're going. Yep. Well, I think that's an excellent uh, closing comment, Jay, and I appreciate your time and effort. And obviously, every time we listen to you, we learn we learn a little more. So uh, I think with that, we'll just shut off the questions. And again, if you have anything specific, I know Jay's got an email address that folks can uh, send him with comments, and he's he'd probably be more than happy to answer your questions that way too. So absolutely. With that. Holly, I'll turn it back over to you. And, Jay, again, I really appreciate your, your delivery. It's smooth and, and easy listening to. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to talk about a highlight in agriculture. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to chime in. Thank you again, Jay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for everybody that supports us, including Emily at AT&T and Daryl Outlaw at the Southern Regional Extension Forestry. We appreciate all the assistance we get in the background for conducting these webinars. If anybody has any problem uh, earning your CEUs or trying to follow up with that process, I know I'll hear from you. You can contact me at my email address, and we'll take care of things for you in the background. So that concludes our presentation today. Thank you. Bye.